let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we need your help. Please open our hearts to what you have for us through your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to make it clear to start out here that um, this short message is for the Christian, for the church. Number two, I want to make it clear that I am not judging your heart or your motives. I'm simply trying to speak truth according to the Word of God and according to what the church has always believed. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, God giveth more grace, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Part of that grace that God gives is grace to please God, grace for the humble one to please God, to be found a faithful worker together with him, and to have God's smile and God's success. The popular church today does not have God's success. She seeks to have a following. She seeks relevance. She is concerned with having the world's approval. She loves the world and loves to imitate the world. She's not happy nor content with only Christ and who she is in Christ. Most think that it's up to us, up to the church, to build Christ's church. That's a mistaken thought. It's up to Christ to build his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's up to us to obey our head and to submit ourselves to his authority, to do his will, to humble ourselves before him. But Christ is the one who builds his church. And that frees us up to so much bondage in trying to impress and draw the world through our humanness when it's actually Christ and his power that draws the world to God. So, as I said, most think that it's up to us to build the church. So, therefore, we, the church, obsess ourselves with impressing the world by taking on her ways in order to draw the world. We change our worship to attract the world, or we could say to flirt with the world, to seduce the world. We change our worship. It becomes choreographed, it becomes professionalized. It becomes worldly. It takes on the rhythm of the world. Rather than our worship being, rather than our worship collectively proceeding from a heart of daily worship, and our collective worship flows out of that humility, um, we also change our ministry focus. We change our ministry focus to a recruiting PR program for the worldly hearted to try to bring them to the church rather than our ministry focus simply being what God tells us to visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We change our identity to give the impression of rich, politically powerful and a people who are proud of who we are, rather than identify like the early church did, which had no buildings, no money, and no political influence, and lowly hearted. Yet they turned the empire upside down. Sadly, we even try to change our looks. 
trying to look like the world with makeup and dyed hair and wearing of jewelry and costly and sensuous dress. Uh, we sadly do that over the fact that every time the Bible portrays makeup, it's portrayed as a negative or a seductive practice. Uh, sadly, we do that over uh, the fact that Jesus said that we can't make one hair white or black. We do that over the fact that the New Testament condemns the wearing of jewelry and costly array and being sensual. Um, even the early persecuted church leaders, pastors, fathers as they're often called, preached on this and how we have changed our interpretations of God's words as a church from what the leaders once taught to what they teach now. I believe it's to please the world or God would call it our lover if we are to be in love with him and we love the world. So um, let me just clarify, I know that the Old Testament does speak several times of wearing of jewelry and is not in a negative, portrayed in a negative way. Um, that's Old Testament. You go to the New Testament and it does show it as a negative. God says, not this, but this. Um, that's always used, that phrase is always used um, by the Word of God to say none of this and all of this. That may be for another time. It is little wonder that the modern pop church sits nearly naked in the filthy shame of her self-manufactured glory her redefined holiness, her hollow success based on facade of number counting, of moneyed leaders, and of societal approval. We sit desolate because God is far from our mockery of church and because God is far from our false example of how God is. When we return I believe when we return to the humble and modest basics, scorned though they be, we will have God again, or rather God will delight to dwell within us and call us His people. What is basic? It is, as Isaiah teaches us in uh, Isaiah 57 verse 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see, I can't help it how I am. We can't help it how our church is. Everyone's doing it it would be too hard to go against the flow. This is how I am. But you say you can't help how you are. Do you want change? I want change. If you want change, then you ask God specifically to reveal himself to you like he did to Isaiah in chapter six. So that self is deplored. He said, woe is me. So that self is humbled. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Pride was gone. And so that self, Isaiah, and so that ourself is changed, made holy, purged, so to speak, as Isaiah chapter 6 says, by God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. He is our only hope. But what a hope he is. He is high, he is lofty and holy. He brings change, God brings change, God brings hope, and God gives victory. God gives himself to the humble. Praise God.